Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us here this morning. We just want to try and add to the the current training that's been going on on, on new schemes. We wanted to try and make sure that the road scheme is represented in that and that we we have what we need for to kick our road scheme off. We're, we're about to do that again. The road scheme officially opened back in June uh, of this year. We've been accepting applications since, since June. And we now want to uh, fully fully ramp up our output of forest road cases under the, the new program. Um, I'll just start sharing here, if you just give me a moment. We have a, a, a couple of presentations this morning on on the new program. I'm just going to give you an outline of what's involved here uh, in in the program itself, the direction of that, what we're trying to do and achieve with our new roads program. Uh, we'll be joined then by Martina Monahan from our approval section is going to uh, explain the new opt-in, very briefly expl explain the new opt-in process. And like the afforestation uh, scheme, we have an opt-in process also for forest roads to, to make sure our roads are, are essentially transposed into the new program. And then our engineering colleagues, uh, Eugene Price and Robert Leonard, are going to talk us through some of the uh, issues and some of the uh, requirements of the of the new of the road scheme in terms of design requirements and standard requirements that are there and also in terms of some of the things that we've been learning and noticing from the applications that we've been processing particularly in relation to single single consent so i'm going to kick off here i presume everybody can hear me okay i'm going to keep going on the slides and yeah so we have a focus on forest roads i think it's important um in in terms of of the the role that the forest road scheme plays in the wider forestry chain it's very very important it enables at a basic level our a mobilization of timber into the markets uh it's really critical it's critical for access to markets for timber it's the first point on on that transition from from growing timber into uh timber for sale in in the marketplace and in, in processing it also gives us access to forests for different reasons, and recreation is obviously critical for that. But I think from, from our perspective here, what we see, the relationship of roads to the confidence of the sector, the ability of growers to bring timber to market, having a good working road scheme, I think is central to that and is critical to that, to that confidence. So we're very keen to see that, that, uh, that that's in place and that that confidence is is underpinned and supported here and the, the roads program is is a really big part of that um what you'll have seen in the last few years anybody working in the sector you'll have seen their requirements for roads in terms of consent requirements and licensing you'll have seen that increase over time and for those of you who've been in the in the business for 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 for, for a long time now you'll have seen that uh, we started from a very light base in terms of regulatory base. There was a very long period where there was no regulatory requirements almost on forest roads. And I think when you go back to uh, around around this 2000 mark, around the start to start of, of the new century, um, that, that introduction of more uh, consent uh, requirements, more formal planning and more formal uh, licensing requirements. And prior to that, Really, there was grant aid. There was a grant process there. People applied for grants, but the licensing requirement wasn't wasn't as strong. And we've moved in the last few years into a, a much more formal system and a much more uh, developed system in terms of forest roads uh, consent, uh, right up to the introduction of single consent requirements in uh, in 2020. So uh, we, we've come quite quite a long way. Much of the new licensing requirements come from the Forestry Act and forestry regulations attached uh, to that act in, in hard legislation. So we're operating in a very regulated environment, like, like many other, other parts of forestry. And again, we have things and the purpose of that regulation is to make sure that we get the mix on our forest roads right and that we do the right things and that we have good outcomes for, for, from, from those and that the process is, is controlled uh, and particularly from an environmental point of view, that we have the right controls in 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 place on this, uh, and and I suppose we we're working now to make sure that those 
uh, translate then into, into a workable system and a workable scheme. So in 2022, we've had a lot of, we had a lot of new requirements there, particularly in single consent. And in 2022, we had a, we had a pretty good year in 2022. We managed a, a case management system on our side here. Uh, we had a lot of different applications. We had lots of different issues, particularly from single consent, as we as this bedded in and we were getting used to that system. That adjustment process was quite difficult. Some of that occurred during the pandemic phase. Getting to meet people and getting to deal with people was very difficult in that environment. And uh, the new requirements themselves, they were also quite technically onerous. The new requirements on, on entrances getting to grips with that was was quite a challenge so what we have what we did last year was we had a case management and monitoring we had a team of people here working on our forest roads we had contract engineers uh davits in, in leitrim assisting us and we had a couple of process workshops with different uh different participants different expert uh, uh, in in the area uh in road applications companies who are producing lots of road applications and we worked out a number of different things, a checklist for new applications. We worked out uh, different scenarios for entrances. At what point do, do, do single consent apply? And we looked at our further information requests, making sure that the information that was outgoing was clear to the sector, clear to people receiving those requests. And we also, really importantly, in 2022, we had an ecology backlog and that was addressed during 2022. And a lot of the road cases that we had that were in in the mix with ecology, they became available to us during that space after after a while in the system, and they became available to us during 2022. So all, all of these things, when we added all these things together, delivered a huge amount of road licenses last year, 718 licenses, um, equivalent to about 290 kilometers of road, which was which was quite quite astounding uh, in, in many ways. And we learned a lot, I think critically in developing those different processes, we learned a huge amount about our forest road system. And uh, and of course, I think I think that was one of the largest single years of, of roads. So we turned the corner then into our new, and we've been developing during 2022 also, the new program and planning that. And we turned the corner into 2023 with our new uh, forest roads program. And there's lots of different measures available to us in in, in that uh, the key one is to try and keep on top of our uh, grant aid requirements the costs have increased we increased the cost to 55 euros per linear meter we've increased the costs available the grant aid available for special construction works for special crossings or special engineering works to 10000 euros per 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 prog project that's a doubling of the grant from the previous 5000 euros and we've maintained 130 kilometers equivalent provision in the available grant aid that we can support the construction annually of around 130 kilometers of road. So we have a uh, road design support measure because there is more onerous engineering design requirements. We've supported that through a road design measure in the program. And we've also wanted to see, we also want to see that our forest road developments, that they keep pace with our intentions with the new forestry program in terms of biodiversity and environmental outcomes that we have a road system that can contribute to those positively. So we've included a biodiversity measure where we can put biodiversity uh, components and biodiversity enhancement uh, measures onto new forest roads to, to make them more, uh, more, more amenable to, to wildlife and so on. And also for water attenuation, which is a really important one. When we talk about water, and drains on forestry road, forest road systems that we can break some of the uh, linkages there between forest road drains and wider uh, wider water management in, in it and keep water much as they do on the main public road networks now we can keep that water hold it and release it in a controlled fashion in an environmentally uh, positive way and those water attenuation features in themselves become biodiversity uh, features uh, we also want to see the use of recycled materials, suitable recycled materials, particularly uh, demolition waste, uh, being being used in the in the scheme. That has a number of, of, of positive aspects. The main one is in in terms of reducing the carbon footprint 
the overall carbon footprint of our road network. And secondly, then uh, the visibility of that, that we're seen to be part of that circular economy, we're seen to be part of that measure uh, to reduce the, 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 the waste and reuse stuff where we, where, we, where we can. And there's cost. I think there should be positive cost implications for that as well in reducing the costs of road development and reducing the amounts of, 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 um, uh, of materials involved. So we also have a link in a second scheme, the Innovative Forest Technology Scheme. We will have a number of measures there related to transport of timber that relate to roads also, and that relate to temporary bridging, the use of temporary bridging and the use of temporary road systems. They'll be supported in the Forest Technology Scheme. They won't be available probably until quarter one of, of 2024 uh, in the next year. We want to get this scheme bedded in, get our afforestation scheme bedded in. And in the new year, then we'll start to look at these other and introducing these other schemes into the process. So obviously then we turn the corner into 2023. We have the requirements there, all of that process that went on with the state aid requirements. Our forest road system isn't subject to state aid. It's operated under the agricultural block exemption regulation uh, measures that, that are there. But we were also subject to the requirement for to have a strategic environmental assessment and a number of other aspects in place for this. And while we were, we, we've obviously been quite restricted in our roads output uh, during the last few months arising from this. So um, when we look at what we did in 2022, 2023 is obviously a very, very different story. And the challenge that we have now is to uh, get the remaining applications that we have on hand to get those out to yourselves as quickly as possible in the remaining elements, uh, the remaining months of, of 2023 here, and to deliver those roads, uh, those road approvals and licenses um, as, as quickly as we can. So while the last year has been going on, we've, we've continued to process applications up to a point, and we're now at a stage where it's time to move those to the last stage of processing. Uh, as many of those as we can. We have a lot of new applications in the same time frame as well that have come in. And the challenge is to move those off in a coherent way in the last few months of, of 2023. So we're now starting uh, that, that process. We have the parts that we need. We've just finished programming our IFRS elements and testing those. We're now in the process of final testing on those. And um, I'm expecting that we'll be in a position to start issuing approvals from the 1st of November. Uh, for the cases that we have on hand and to try and accelerate that process over the next uh, the next couple of weeks. We've not much time left to do this in. So also in the last few months, we've had some other measures based on what we've learned from last year and the preceding years, particularly with single consent. We've realized that uh, we need to have professional engineering uh, support. Many of you out there are working with that on a daily basis. You have engineers working on your road cases. and we have also matched that here on our side. We have two engineer staff now, uh, John Cryan and Eugene Price, are working with us on, on our roads processes here uh, from a professional engineering perspective, along with Dr. Robert Leonard. And I think we have, uh, we have the engineering staff that we, we needed to, to do this. And, and learning how that works for us and putting those people to, to work on this, that's been, that's been really great in the last couple of weeks and getting those people up to speed on what's needed and being able to support our inspectorate here in relation to forest roads, that's been, that's been critical. And obviously then to try and make sure that our own staff and yourselves are fully oriented and trained in terms of what we're doing, where the road, what the requirements are for the road schemes and where we need to focus in terms of particular, particular areas of, of the, the process that need focus, we, we, we can provide that now. Um, we want to get back into our case management process that worked very, very well for us last year. And we want to try and get back into that state, particularly here in the last few months, to focus uh, the, the cases out. And from a week to week, to make sure that we have outputs. Last year, we had the licensing plan, and that worked very well in helping us provide that focus. We want to get back into that space now. And also, not every forest road is straightforward. We do have quite a lot of cases in areas and in particular locations, particular settings that are complex. 
uh, be that on the public road or be that environmental comp complexities, particular uh, environmental complexities or design complexities, for example, crossings, difficult crossings, steep ravines, difficult terrain. Uh, we want to try and develop a complex case uh, approach for these, that we can identify these difficult cases as early as possible and make sure that they're addressed with the right, uh, the right people and the right approaches as early as possible. And of course, it, it comes back then with our own uh, engineering staff. They're, they're engineers. They're subject to the same uh, continuous professional development. And we want to make sure as well for the sector that there's enough CPD uh, measures there on roads. We need to get into that space to make sure that we have uh, an appropriate continuous professional development process for forest roads and that people participate in that. So that's that's something we need to look at for, for, for the new year. Um, and right now, I think just getting our own staff in, bedded in, we've done that. Getting people working through cases, uh, the engineer team, team that are here, assisting inspectors to work through the cases that we have uh, has been critical. And that's, that, that's, that's worked very well for us so, so far. So the proof of the pudding, I think, is going to come in the, in the next few weeks. Um, so again, for, for, for this remaining pro program, we have most of the things that we need are in place. It's about get, getting into it. The ABR measure, the new forest road uh, system is not subject to the same state aid rules as aforestation. It's quite separate uh, and different. Um, but again, we have, we have requirements there uh, and we want to just process the cases we have uh, in the usual way. Um, for the first part of 2023 and up to, up to now, we've really only had access to non-grant aid applications. And we've been working through those here uh, as, we, as we go along. Um, and yeah, we have our engineering team. A, a rollout plan is in place. We have that in, in place now for, for a couple of weeks on these cases. And we have a provision there in grant aid to work with. So that's what we're trying to fill. We have about 51, 52 kilometers of equivalent licenses issued now for 2023. And that remaining uh, uh, allowance there is about, eight, about 80 kilometers uh, still, to, still to make up. So we, we want to try and do that. And again, that case manager will be in contact. The companies there and people that have licenses, we're going to be in contact with you over the next few weeks to, to get those last cases through. And we'd like your cooperation with that. And again, today is just a taster on training. We've more to do on training. And I think over the next few months and into 2024, we'll be back uh, with, more, with more of that. And we want some feedback from yourselves in terms of what you think you need to do your roles and your jobs out there on forest roads. Uh, please come back and keep us up to date with what you need. If there are requirements there for training, let us know what they are and we'll try and address those as best we can. And I think, look, the training element is going to be important. What we want to try and do also is develop a type of community around forest roads um, of, of experts there and to make sure that there's good exchange and good contact on the roads uh, scheme uh, back and forth on it, that we, we have positive exchanges on that and that we can address the things that we need to address and that we know what those things are. And I think good quality applications are central to a good applications process and a good experience with that applications process. Uh, the better the applications we get, the better quality applications, the easier it is for us to process those. If the design measures are right in the first stages, if the environmental requirements are identified correctly in the initial stages and catered for in the designs, we can process those applications much more readily. And especially where the single consent elements are required with the public road network, um, it's really, really important that we have those requirements identified early as, uh, and addressed in the application day one. We can then process those with our local authorities. It's really important with the local authorities that we have the trust. We're dealing with public safety issues on the public road and the trust of those local authorities is, is central to this and is central to our experience with applications. The more they trust us, the easier it is for us to have um, good outcomes with our, with our applications. And good outcomes, good projects, develop uh, good, good trust and, and, a, and a good sense that, that people know what they're doing 
and that we're, we're responsible with these applications. Um, another area just on costs, I think we have to be, and yourselves in the sector, need to be aware of costs. And obviously you, you, you will be aware of costs is to make sure that we try and keep those costs uh, within within reasonable limit. The, the scheme allows, uh, and the new scheme um, is much more clear around the use of on-site materials and so on. That's been catered for in the scheme as far as we can. And we want to see the use of crossings. We want to see better design work on our crossings, use of standard designs that are there, and the use of the processes that are catered for. And I think when people start doing that, it's going to help with with the cost it stops people coming back to revise projects or do remedial works get those things right day one that's one of the biggest single issues around uh reducing costs is not having to go back to projects to upgrade them or remediate them uh, at a later point and also where environmental performance of projects it's really really important that we don't have bad environmental outcomes uh, on these that we design for good outcomes and that we do our work and we perform uh, our, our our work in developing roads to 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 get those uh, good good outcomes and that we don't have water quality issues in particular. Um, and again, it's about trust and it's about people understanding that what we're doing here is is a safe business and uh, and that there are good environmental outcomes and good economic outcomes, and employment, all of the things that come from these roads uh, are underpinned by the work that you do out there. On, on designing and implementing these roads. So it's really important that we get those things right and, uh, and that we get those good outcomes. So I am going to hand over uh, to Martina, if, if she's ready there, uh, from, from Johnstone Castle, from our approval section. And Martina is critical to all of this process uh, at the moment in terms of the management of applications. So I'm gonna hand you over to Martina, if you're ready, Martina. Yeah, I am, thanks, Kieran. Right, I'll come off here. Uh, you can just call the slides, Martina, and I'll uh, um, yep. I'll move them for you. Yep. Thanks, Kieran. Great. Thanks. Okay, so I'm just very quickly going to go through um, how we're going through the uh, opt-in process. If you want to pull up the first slide, there, Kieran, please. Very nice. So it's going to be very similar to what we've done with A4 and Russ. So. Um, same again, we've three potential categories of people that can build under the new program. So category one are people who had approval under the old program, but they haven't actually commenced their uh, building by 31st December. So we are in the process of getting opt-in letters ready to go out to these people. So there'll be about 500, near enough 500 people will receive letters offering them the opportunity to opt in. Um, so what we need back from them is the opt-in declaration. That's going to be appendix one attached to the letter that goes out. And then if they want to opt in for any of the extra measures that Kieran mentioned there, the special construction works, engineering design support measure, or the uh, projects with the enhanced emphasis on biodiversity, forest protection, water management, there's Appendix 2 going to be attached to that letter and there'll be just a checkbox on those where they'll have to tick the box to say that they want to opt into those and then just give us a bit of ex explanation at the end of it um, for the, I think it's the forest protection and water management one. Um, Special construction works now for this cohort. Um, they can't have a material change because they've already been approved. If they want a material change to what was approved, that will require a new application. Um, once it comes back in, then we will reassess them if they're up for any of the extra measures. If not, it's fairly straightforward. We'll get the letter out to yourselves then once we've done all the opt-in process. Um, the letter will go out to them saying they've been opted in. And then as usual, they just send in their commencement notice for the single consent roads when they're about to start building. So you can move on to the next one then, please, Kieran. So then category two, um, same as what we did for A for these are the people who um, haven't got their license yet, they've applied under the old program. Uh, so uh, these letters are nearly ready to go as well. And there's nearly there's just over 300 of these people going to get letters. And it's the same thing. We're going to need the opt-in declaration on appendix one. And then the appendix two, if they want to opt in for any of the extra measures, um, the, spe the special construction works. Um, if they want a material change at this stage, it's OK. They can opt for that because it hasn't been um, approved yet. And then once it's opted in, it goes back in through the system and it will be assessed by ecology inspector or whoever needs to look at it in the same way as it would have been. And then decision will start issuing in the usual manner. 
Uh, as Kieran said, we have loaded these held at different points, so there should be a good few ready to go once we get those opt-ins in. And then we will be giving them a, a clause, a sunset clause, at 31st December to get their opt-ins in. But like always, if you need us to extend that time, just contact us and we won't withdraw the application. And then my final slide, Kieran, please, is just category three. And they're submitted already under new programs, so we don't need any new opt-ins from them. And then for both category two and three, the decision will be subject to the 14 working day appeal period rather than just 14 days. And then the site knows, um, same as for our station has been kept in place for five weeks from the date that it's advertised on the website or the FLV. So that's a very quick rundown of what we're going to be doing for you over the next few weeks. Thanks. Thanks, Martina. Um, we, can we hold questions to the end if that's OK? If people have questions, they can put them into the chat um, and we'll, we'll, we'll open those up at the end. But we want to just keep keep going here with the presentations and then just we'll have uh, we'll have time for that then uh, uh, afterwards. Is, is that is that OK? Eugene, are you ready to go there? Yeah, good to go. Good stuff. OK, let's uh, let's roll on. Keep control of the slides there, yeah. Yeah, go on. So, hello. How is everyone? Uh, uh, I don't, I would have met some of you before. Uh, I'm the new one of the new engineers, myself, John. Uh, my contact details are there. Look, if you want to shoot me an email or that, uh, anytime. I'm happy enough to help where I help out where I can. And uh, yeah, so that that's that. My phone number's there as well. So if you want to make note of that. And yeah, Karen, you can start the first slide there. So basically, I'm going to be talking about the common issues that we've seen with applications coming in look there's nothing too major i'm going to keep it at quite a basic level stuff for the minute um these are ones that are common issues across the board or kind of there should be simple enough fixes and i'll just talk you through a few of them so the first one is the sight lines and entrance layouts so on your one to 500 maps we want the sight lines clearly shown to the outside edge of the road so this is something that's come up quite a bit where you see on the top right of that slide there where i've highlighted uh, the end of the sight line i suppose you want you want it on the edge of the public road rather than either in the hedge verge or out in the middle of the road just to give us a correct idea of how much of the hedge is to come out um and again with that uh you have your setback the correct setback there hasn't really been too many issues with that on the x on the three meters back from the edge of the road um like the rough locations into the middle of the road or into the middle of the hedge verge is no real use to us uh, i'm sorry now i'm going to fly enough through these slides fairly quick uh it's just i think most of the value out of this will be from questions from yourselves. So if you if there's any questions on this stuff, we can come back to it. But for the minute, I'm going to keep skimming through. So you can go to the next slide there, Kieran, now. Um, this is an, an, on the next. So if you have a road on the on a bend, particularly bad bends, or I know this is quite a nice curve that you were looking at here, but as you know, in Ireland, they're all over the place. They're, they're squiggly all over the place. So, if you're on the outside edge of a curve, this I've highlighted there in pink, the tan pink tangential line, it's called, we are calling it, including that on the site layout maps is vitally important. Because again, if you have a look at that, you can. it's hard to imagine now with that nice, lovely curve. But generally, if you think you're coming out of an entrance, you might be able to see 150 meters or 160 meters down the road to the right or 100 meters if you're after getting relaxation. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to see 50 meters down the road. Um, because of the nature of a bend on the road. So that's why we include that pink tangential line, especially on if you're on the outside of a bat or you're outside of a big long broad bend or that. It's, uh, it just helps with knowing exactly how much of the hedgerow is supposed to come out of it. Um, you can jump on to the next one, yeah. So that pink tangential line is is vitally important on most of the layouts for on bends. And then this is something then, it's not only just sight lines left and right that can affect your issues, as you're well aware, the, the roads to be undulating up and down, and you could, could be hidden dips, there could be a lump in the road, there could be anything at all. And in situations where this isn't a requirement for all applications, but in areas where if either myself or John or one of us are thinking there might be an issue with being able to see if there's 100 meters marked or 160 meters marked on the site layout, and we've we've seen that, oh, there's a bit of a lump in the road there, and will it's, it's kind of hard to tell just by eye. Uh, it might be a good idea to include a longitudinal survey or a longitudinal section of the public road along the length of the sight line. It's just to give us an idea of your BL mark. Now, that's a very rough sketch I have down the bottom right there, but you, you get the idea. You've probably seen them before, but 
just so you know when you're standing on the entrance to the forestry you'll know if you put 1.05 meters up you draw your line across you're going to know is that lump in the road going to affect it and that would be from a survey at every 10 meters or every five meters depending on how bad the bad the layout of the road is just to give us verification and a good guarantee that okay we'll, we will be achieving these sight lines when the time comes and if there is doubt on it uh we will we will send it back if there's doubt on it obviously but if if you have doubt yourselves it, get it in with the application first and foremost then there, there'll be it'll, it'll help it won't be without any hitching or there won't be any sticking with the application you can jump on to the next one there kieran uh so this this is something that's actually been uh on it, that slide's not coming up great there now for you but uh yeah. this is something that's it's it's not too important anyway well it is important but it's been fairly well nailed by all is across the board like there has been no real issues with this stuff uh as far as i've seen so far um just on the approach to the public road on the first road approach to the public road again we're keeping within the uh confides of your two and a half percent and your four percent for the 15 and 30 meter, or 15 and 20 meters uh approaching the public road and if we're going above that this so this is all to do with traction for lorries and traction for your equipment coming in and out if we are vast majority of the time it's staying within them confines and yes that's been something that's nailed consistently but if we're going above or below that you can end up with obviously issues with drainage so if you're sloping down towards public road that's when we might start having to look at drainage blocks or that kind of thing but primarily what that's for is traction so if you're coming above that spec you're going we're going to then need to look at maybe a bit of macadam in the last five meters or concrete in the last five meters just so we're not ripping up the edge of the public road when we're spinning wheels coming in and out and that's but generally more often than not all the and in most of the applications will could be able to come in under the two and a half percent and four percent and again this is shown on your either shows uh some of you prefer to show that it's a longitudinal section some of you showed like a planned version like that both are both are acceptable um just once that's there but that, yeah that information is displayed quite well so happy enough with that and um, you can go on to the next one there kieran so then i'm going to talk a little bit about relaxation here so as you're not well aware like the standards we're looking for sight lines is generally it'll be your 160 meters on any of the 80 kilometer roads and if we're looking to relax any aspect of the sight lines or entrance locations stuff that will have to be, that's included in the application you know all this already but it just it's a nice to have a bit of a refresher on it um generally for relaxation of sight lines the first port call is going to be your speed survey to determine the 85th percentile approach and this survey will be provided again if there's any doubt with ourselves we'll be requested a speed survey but again it's always good if you could get in with the application just stop any hitching or stop any sticking and with the speed surveys so opinions and determinations without appropriate data is not acceptable so it's not good enough to just say that the speed of the road is 60 kilometers and that's why we've chosen the lesser sight line we need proof as to why the road is six kilometers or some some there needs to be some sort of data included to show us that this is this is why we're looking for a reduction you don't say we could achieve 100 meters sight lines that's why we chose 100 meter sight lines that's that's not going to be acceptable um so yeah well if, if again any questions on that uh we can come back to it but yeah it's just once if you have 100 meter sight lines that's all well and good but you can't just say we got we have 100 meter sight lines therefore the road is 70 kilometers so there needs to be some sort of data with it um, and go on to the next slide there now i'm going to talk a bit more about relaxation you want to, yeah lovely so this is something that's come up i've talked to a few of you about this already Um, it's about what happens when you get your 85th percentile speed and it's in between one of the design speed uh on section i think it's section four, four or that it's in that table anyway so just for clarification now if you have anything that's in between so in my example there i said if you get the 85th percentile back and it's 52 kilometers per hour 52 kilometers per hour is over the design speed of the public road of 50 kilometers an hour therefore your sight line distance is 90 meters 
you're always going to have to, as it says here, is you're going to have to design up approach. We can't choose the lesser figure. It has to always go up. So 52 would be 90. Once you're over the number on the left, you're going to have to go for the higher number on the right. It's just, it's as simple as that. That's, that's how they're going to be read. Um, and yeah, again, that's, that's all there is there. So we can jump onto the next slide. So this now is, this is relaxation of a different category. This is relaxation of entrance location. So the desirable minimum is again, you, you know, this is the 50 meters between entrances on the opposite side of the road and a hundred meters between entrances on the same side of the road. If this isn't available for any reason, or you can't meet this spec because one reason or the other, this should be included in the application. It was like this, we can't, this can be relaxed. This. Uh, criteria the same as the other aspects of the technical document these minimum can be relaxed but you have to note it in the application and say why so for instance i've included just a photograph there of where say if you're wanted entrance on that orange dot or the blue dot on your screen um the reason being it's located there and it directly across from an access is first of all you label what the access across from it is Tell us what is what is it a industrial entrance? Is it a dwelling? Is it an agricultural entrance? And it's all going to obviously the, the less uh, traffic going to be coming in and out the opposite side, the better. But that orange dot can only be located there to achieve the required sight lines at that entrance. And so, by saying in your application, we have chosen this position for the entrance because it's the only reasonable position we can achieve the required sight lines that's an allowable rationale for the selection of our entrance and then we will be able to relax the entrance location requirements um it's just a matter of telling us why or like again it's it's fairly obvious a lot of time you can tell why this entrance is here well it might be the only plot of land you have you know it might be the, the narrow you might come down narrow that your forest could narrow down to one point and you only have one way to get in and out to the road again that's like it's fairly self-explanatory why you had to put the entrance there but just include the rationale behind why the entrance is there whether it be achieving sight lines whether it be your only way in and out whether it be whatever else you might come up with um and again, with the selection entrance location, you should always have at the forefront of your head safety first. Realistically, um, we want you want your entrances to be in as safe a location as possible. So, like, we won't be able if you're putting your entrance and there's a rationale that the entrance is going here because of X, but it's more dangerous than another place. It'll be you'll it'll we'll kind of want it at the safer location. That's that's pretty much that. Um, you could jump onto the next slide there, Karen. Uh, so this is with engagement with stakeholders. So I think as part of the new scheme now, um, prior to sending in your application, get the details of if you're crossing across any private land, get the details of the right away or get the legal agreement between yourself and the private landowner and send that in with the application. It'll help things a lot. It'll make you make a lot less sticking points and a lot less uh, concerns from our side with so include any of them right ways or agreements you have with the private landowner in the application prior to sending it in uh, otherwise it'll just be sent back looking for looking for that agreement with the landowner um that's that's what the second point says so if regarding access it will delay the application if we have concerns about the right away or how you're going to cross that section of land so it's always good to include that um yeah, that's sound clear. And you can go on to the next one there. Uh, this is just a couple of other things. These are the, the ones I've talked about earlier are generally the most common issues that come up with the applications. These are other ones to keep in mind. Uh, they're generally fairly explanatory, like you want to avoid entrances on the inside of a curve. We want to be coming in perpendicular to the road, if at all possible. Um, it's not always possible, but generally where you can try and do it. Um, and then if in instances where there is a departure for standard from standard or it's decided that there's a departure from standard discussions between yourselves and the local authority will have to happen and 
the result of these discussions and whatever was agreed in these discussions, put them on the engineer's report or put a copy of them on the engineer's report and include them with the application. So that's coming in as a new application and you're marking that as a departure and you're showing us where the, what agreement you came up to come came up with with the local authority. And then this is another thing that uh, generally it's better to like the reports don't, uh, the less copy and paste in from the technical standard, I know it's not, it's, it's not as simple as that, but the less copy and paste in from application to application, cross application and from the technical standard in just generic stuff into the applications, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to get through them and to like when it's very site specific to stuff in the reports and that it helps a lot and it uh, makes the process that little bit easier, but uh, generally it's, it's fairly good with that as well. So. Yeah, you can jump on to the next one there, Karen. So this is just a I'll fly through this as well. This is a uh, water row crossings and water management. So generally from now, like between aquatic zones and environmental considerations, clear span solutions are undertaken by suitably qualified designer will be the preferable way of crossing over aquatic zones. And there is some standard designs in the cofort manual i believe um but i'm not i am um, again th these these will there's not much in the way of recommendations for that for the minute but they will be the preferred undertaking and they will sort out a lot of hitching and sticking with applications as well if there is clear span solutions over areas of concern um and then that second part then this is a bit more technical i only spent two seconds on it but this is for any other instances where you might have a crossing over a substantial relevant water course or any other where you're crossing over any sort of waterway particularly substantial ones is the sizing of your culverts and the sizing of whatever pipes you're using is going to have to conform to the estimation of waterway area which is in the Coford manual and um, that's it down uh, there the e7 that's it it's this relatively straightforward calculation that just include it in the engineer's report and say that that's that's why we came to that sizing and if on the next slide now i've just included a very very rough sketch of what what that might look at. like say that black dot there you can, in the center of that map the center of the blue if that's where you're crossing over any sort of waterway that where you need a significant culvert it might it does not not a quag zone scan that we've discussed we prefer the uh clear span in them but you might it might be needing say a 600 mil or 800 mil culvert pipe or whatever uh, just include a simple sketch of the area. You can use the the hydrology layers on IFRS as well. They have catchment layers. They have catchment, uh, subcatchment sections. Include a sketch of the area, roughly the area that will be draining into that side. It's all it's all part of that water area calculation. Then you include a rough estimation of your coefficient and you calculate it up, and it should give you a fairly decent idea it's just, it's a fairly rudimentary calculation but it'll give you some idea of if the culvert you're using is properly sized or not um and include that in the report and just that, that that's great we can just take that off and say yeah well look they've, they've sized up that correctly and we're happy to continue it um and so you can jump onto the next slide there Kieran. I'm going back a bit now to entrances. So just for yourselves, for when you're coming out onto the public road, you're generally going to have three scenarios. You're, you're going to have a new entrance onto a road. You're going to have an existing entrance that does not require material widening, or you're going to have an existing entrance that does require material widening. And each of these three things will require different elements from yourselves so obviously for a new and new entrance you're going to need full single consent an existing entrance that does not require material widening will not always need single consent and then an existing entrance that does require material line will again need single consent so it's just a matter of making sure that when you are going particularly for if you're not going to go for single consent you need to be like the existing entrance need you need to make sure you're following the definition of the existing entrances and material widening which I've included on the next slide. Kieran. So just this is just this is uh, your information on existing entrances and material widening. So there's we've 
spend a bit of time when applications come in and there's a bit of talk between the di or whatever or ourselves about okay is this defined as an existing entrance or is this defined as material widening we'll be we've been having a look at these and we we'll decide and send back either an fir or whatever based on our determination of the fact but just for yourselves when you're sending sending in an application particularly material widening if that's your definitions there there your standards for your entrance need to make like obviously if you have 14.2 meter wide existing entrance there that will allow you to do a half bell mount and assist so on and so forth for and as you go up you see sorry i'll start at the top but you have yeah like your material widening is essentially two meters or 20 percent, whichever is greater so if you have a 14.2 meter wide entrance you're 22 meters or 20 percent you're going to be able to use your 17 meter half bell mount and the same for the full bell mount 24 meters to 29 meters um it's a matter of defining that and deciding for yourselves what way you just want to go if you just want to go for full single consent if you require a full bell like if you 14.2 meters of an entrance and you need a full bell mount then you're going to need full single consent and if you only require half bell mount, you will not need full single consent. So there is, it, there's an important distinction between stuff there. And for ease for yourselves, you don't want to be going through full single consent when you might necessarily require it. Um, so it's just always something to be aware of. And then the definition of an existing entrance is an existing entrance. Any entrance or opening, a road vehicle can pass through. So that could be a car, it could be a lorry. Um, and that the useful surface of the entrance is surface with stone, aggregate, concrete, tarmacadam, or similar. So, any site where you have either, like, say, most of these will be dealing with agricultural sites where you might have the, been, the, the agricultural gate could be drove in and out of for the last however many years, and it's well compacted down, but it's only compacted soil. That's not actually going to be defined as a existing entrance. We need some sort of hardcore down there. Um, to define that as an existing entrance. So even if you have your 14.2 meter wide entrance, but you don't have any hardcore or stone down, it's still going to require single consent. So there's a lot of back and forth between these two. And it's again, look, if there's any issues or anything, yeah, like we, you, we can figure them out. Or if there's any queries and this stuff, you can shoot me an email and um, I'm happy to help. We're happy to. Yeah, that's happy to help. So that's the that's the end of me now, Kieran. Um, I think the, the last slide is just questions. Thanks, I'm sure if you, yeah, if we're you getting some, really look. We're getting some really good uh, questions in. So um, we get Robert uh, Leonard. If you're if you're ready, Robert, we'll we'll jump you in here and um, we'll get on yeah. to those questions. And once you're once you're ready, are you ready? I'm Robert? ready. I'm ready, Kieran. Great. Thanks very much. Hopefully, everyone can hear me clearly. Okay. Um, you know, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Robert Leonard. Um, I've been working with the Forest Service, as was the forest side of, of the department, for a, a number of years now on engineering issues. So I'm just going to um, go briefly through some of the main points from the Forest Road Manual. Some of the things, the things that I usually miss, so covering, looking really at dimensions and things, and just sort of um, go through a bit of detail on materials. Um, next slide, Karen. Um, I suppose, really, I suppose, what's the importance of good design of timber forest roads? So if you're looking at designing forest roads to ensure you can get the timber out of the forest, um, it is it is important. It's not just for the thinnings. You've got that you, when you're building a road, it's covered for the thinnings, clear felt, replanting. It's the basis of your road going forward. So it, it is important when you're actually constructing a road that it is done correctly. There's no point in just doing it. Thank you. Oh, I need it for a short few years. It's not. It's going to be there for a long term. It's whatever you do now. It's the basis of ongoing forest the forest management. So, and it also, as Kieran highlighted before, it's access to the forest, and it is, as I say, a long term investment. Um, next, Kieran. Because the two documents you need to be mindful of when you're designing forest roads is the Coford Forest Roads Manual. Um, it's a there is a the first edition is available on the Coford um, site itself. So if you search for the Coford Forest Roads Manual, you can download a version of it. 
and also then the technical standard for design of forest entrances, which is what Eugene has just been going through um, in terms of the more specific details. It's important, I suppose, when you're designing roads and planning it, laying out what you're um, a road in a forest, that you have both of these documents and do refer to them. Um, I can't stress that enough. They are, they give all the details. If you follow what's in them, you will be all right. Um, if you don't follow them, that is when problems start to arise. Um, next, Karen. Thank you. Um, so what is a forest road? Well, a forest road is any road other than a public road that serves the forest. So that is, if the road is even going through open farmland, going towards the forest, that is a forest road as well. So you're looking at a road that can carry, you're looking at taking um, cars, fully laden lorries then as well. So it is important that the road is structurally sound. Um, quite often the forest road is actually going to be stronger than some of the um, local roads you're actually accessing from. But it is important that they are properly constructed, that they can there serve the forest properly. So they're providing the full access into the forest. So that's what a forest road is. Um, next, Kieran, please. So the forest road. So just to clarify, um, it's been coming up a few times um, the difference between tracks, racks, and roads. Uh, an engineered track is defined as any engineered level cambered formation, so a cambered foundation of four meters width capable of supporting harvesting machines without causing rutting to the formation. So that the track is actually engineered and worked. It's not just a case of driving in uh, into a bit of a into the forest. That is not a track. You then have racks and um, more harvest tracks, um, which are previously undisturbed ground or, or unplanted clearances or where you're felled rows of trees, et cetera, over which timber extraction operates. Um, you have to remember neither tracks nor racks are suitable for road going vehicles. So you're not going to be bringing in um, HGVs, full lorries to extract timber over either a track or a rack. If you're working, if you're looking at actually having a suitable um, facility, I suppose is the best way of phrasing it initially, um, to access a forest for lorries, you are constructing a forest road. So you will do have to follow all the requirements. Doesn't matter whether you're just kind of just leaving it there for four weeks or four years. That is a forest road and needs to meet all the requirements and consent requirements. So next, Kieran. Um, Thank you, Karen. All right. Can I just ask everybody just to mute your mic? If your mic is open, you might just close it off so we don't hear your private conversations. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, Robert. Uh, okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, just now, I suppose, in relation to the forest, the road standards themselves, um, a number of um, drawings come, I'm going to go through here now. These are all taken from the forest road manual. So these shouldn't be new to you as you're going through them. I suppose just the first thing, the tree clearance. Um, it's important to get the full 15 meters tree clearance um, and all the brash must be removed from the site unless it's a peat site. If it's a mineral site, the brash, any tops lopped, must be removed from the alignment of the carriageway. Um, it's also, they should be cleared from the site really. Um, the tree clearance is important for a number of reasons. It allows full formation to be provided. It provides, allows for the full, the required, the drainage to be provided at the required distance from the road. The drainage shouldn't be immediately tight to the road. You should be two to three meters back, depending on where, whether you're actually working on embankment or on level ground. So, and, and it's important to have the tree clearance there. It also ensures that the roadway is dry, will be dry. So it's not, a, there's no point in just trimming out just the, bare six meters so you can actually work in and construct a road that doesn't provide this suitable space to provide the correct drainage and then allow the road to remain dry during use and operation over its lifetime. So it is important to provide the full tree clearance at initial stage. That's the first thing to do. You go and provide the full 15 meters clearance between the trees. Okay, that is center of tree to center of tree. Um, so you'd in some ways, so the actual overall allowance for any growth from the trees can come into that 15 meter gap. 
the drainage is important again it must be excavated before the road is constructed uh, so you're actually providing a dry um, area for actually construction um, there is the standard saying a wet road is a weak road so it is important you're working in a dry area and that drainage is provided again so that must be done at an early stage in road construction the gradient um, of the alignments it is important to make sure um, you have a minimum gradient 1 to 100 to allow water to flow off a relatively level road and on steep on and the maximum is 1 to 10. Um, it is in for very short spaces probably less than sort of 20 or 30 meters long to exceed that for very short periods but the difficulty is if you're exceeding the 1 in 10 it can be very difficult particularly for empty lorries to actually maneuver through that uh, along those gradients so the 1 in 10 is important there and on curves the maximum gradient should be no more than 1 in 12. You, um, it is very difficult for the lorries to get round any steeper so it is important that those are achieved and you should be walking along the road line once to make sure you have those curves it's not good enough just in the actual the forms to actually put in or oh, get one in ten or one in whatever you need to walk along it verify you are actually achieving the one in ten if it's not you need to look at it alternative routes to see how it's actually going to be achieved so those gradients are important you do need to make sure you actually achieve them um, next Karen. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next one, the actual road dimensions. Um, this is a, quite often you see shortcomings on these. Um, you have the bell mouth there on the left hand side. That is the standard bell mouth. You have the 12 meter curve on either side. That comes back to the road being five meters wide at 12 meters back, not three and a half meters. You have a further 20 meters back before the road reduces three and a half meters. That is to allow the lorries to actually the trailer of the lorry to track in correctly and safely on the road. So it's important that you have the foot. It's the it is five meters wide, the twelve meters back. So your twelve, your twenty-seven meters wide minimum is the bell mouth to actually have a full bell mouth. A half bell mouth isn't half the width, isn't down. At, it is five. Plus, it is actually seventeen meters minimum to have a half bell mouth. Um, you're only just losing your losing only the 12 meters not the full um 14 and a half meters so remember that it is important to get those dimensions right to have that width so it'll just take up to 20 to 32 meters back from the where the bell mouth starts to the um, alignment of the road before you're back at 3.4 meters for the general uh, road widths um the t-turning areas um, it's important to have 30 meters back um, to the edge of the end of the turning areas from the center line of the road. Um, that is to provide sufficient space for the lorries to turn it, to reverse in fully, to have comfortable um, turning areas. It does allow a small bit of stacking area at the back, um, but it is important to have the full 30 meters um, to allow for tolerance of movement and for the lorries to get fully in. Additionally, it is important that the road opposite the turning area is widened out to five five point to five meters wide in full. Uh, yeah, it is you know it's five five and a half meters wide, and for full length of fifty five meters across the width of the turning area. That's to provide for proper maneuvering and safe maneuvering of the lorries around that turning area. So again, though that that's something that is often missed, and it is something we're watching out for. So do make sure they are widened at the T turning. The road is widened. It's not just continuing to the three three point four meters wide. It's widened to the full five point five meters where your turning areas. Um, next, please, Kieran. Again, just um, a few more for the the turning areas um, where you have a T turning from a public road. You see there that the actual road width is the main the line is the full five and a half meters for the full width. There's no reduction in the width coming back from the bell mouth as you would have if you were going onto a forest road so it is important to make sure you achieve those full widths if you have a start, full just a back in loading bay so you're just reversing in from the public road it's to be full five meters for the full full length of that loading bay and it's to be and they would normally be between 25 to 50 meters long again at the bell mouth it's 12 meters wide so you're looking 
when you're 29 meters then to actually have the full bell mouth if it's a back in loading bay. So it, that is wider than if it's just going on to a standard forest road. And the same with the T turning area coming in from a forest road, from the public road. Again, you're, that, you're uh, up at 29 metres wide there. So it is important to actually provide the full width. That is to provide the lorries full access to actually get in there and to ensure it is important to actually get in safely. Um, the turning circle, it's a minimum of 24 metres diameter. That is to enable the lorries to actually properly maneuver around it so they're not having to, so they can just swing around and turn in one movement, not having to reverse or try and other turn. So it is important to provide the full 24 meters turning circle. And next, Kieran, please. Um, just another area on curves. Um, it is important that the road is widened so that you're actually getting the proper. Um, the lorries, the trailer will track behind the tractor unit of the lorry. Um, depending on the curves, there is actually a full table in the forest road manual of the actual required extra widening for the curve, depending on the on the radius of the curve. So you can see there for this one, you were 90, 18 degree radius. It's an extra width of 3.3 meters on the inside of the curve um, to make sure the lorry, the vehicle stays safely on the road. And it is important to provide that extra width on the curves to keep that is to enable full safe usage of the forest road. Also, then um, it's important on the longer roads and um, provide passing areas every 300 meters. It is set out in the forest road manual for it to be there. Um, they should be 20 meters long for the minimum full length and then overall 40 meters long. So you've 10 meter lead in, 10 meters lead out at either end, full five meters wide. Um, the full 20 meters is required to enable a HGV to pull in fully and safely in. Um, Lorries, they are about 17 and a half meters long, so it is important to have them there. Um, next, Kieran, please. Um, back one. Thank you. Um, just the, in terms of the overall, yeah, the formation. Just to go a bit more detail on these, and um, you have the formation uh, minimum of five and a half meters wide, and um, sometimes referred to the sub base or capping. That is the main base of the construction of the road, the full foundation. Uh, before putting it in place, it is important you should remove any subsoil or any topsoil that is on on site. Um, if it's not on peat, any there should be no um, brush or logs or anything on there. Um, they will rot over time, I'll come to that in a bit more. So again, the carriageway then is on top, that is the actual driving surface, and that should be th minimum 3.4 meters along straight sections and widened as I've already discussed on the turning areas and on curves. Um, it's important there is a camber there on that as well, 100 millimeter camber in the carriageway. That carriageway should, that camber should be being carried up from the formation, so the formation should also be cambered as well. It's not just the carriageway. So, and the carriageway should be so between 50 to 100 millimeters deep. And that would be something like eight or three or eight or four, close eight or three, eight or four. Come to that in a minute. And then the drainage, again, set out in two meters from the edge of the formation to provide a full dry area you're actually working with. And the, the Forest Road Manuals has a full list of depths of formations. So, depending on your ground conditions, determines how thick, how deep the formation is. So what level of foundation you're effectively putting into your forest road. If you're on weathered rock or sandy gravel, it can be quite thin, that is well drained. You got 200 millimeters thick, um, increasing up to 750 millimeters thick if you're on a heavy clay um, with the, which is poorly drained. So it is important to know what, can, what your ground conditions are, to know what actual um, depth of material is required. Um, next, please, Kieran. Just um, as I mentioned, pavement materials, um, should 803 or 804, 805, um, should be uh, 75 to 100 millimeters thick. So that should be well graded NRA grade material that you're actually working on. That's important because it also provides a good wearing surface um, that the lorries and will get the grip on and, and wear. For mineral soils, um, always remove all topsoil, gra top, topsoil grass stumps, 
Top and lop should not be there under a mineral on a mineral site. They will decay over time and leave holes and weaken the road. So it's important they are not there. That your work directly down to the soil, or if you need to, you put in a geotextile there instead. But not lop and top that will decay over the time over time and weaken the road. Um, for the formation, we've heard so in terms of material sizing, it's seventy five to one hundred and fifty mil. Should be graded material, so gravel, shale, crushed limestone, along those lines, with less than six percent fines. And um, the use of pit run isn't suitable. It should be graded material you're using for the formation. Uh, pit run is not graded. Uh, you can have very large materials in that, and um, such that actually with for thinner roads would be greater than the actual thickness of the actual road. So it is important. Um, that you have well graded material. Forest Road Manual recommends no more than 75 millimeter diameter material used in the formations. Um, that is so you will get so you can compact it in well and get a strong form, strong base. Um, over peat soils or even yeah, and the use of heavy clay uh, geotextile is an alternative to using brash and stumps. Um, it provides good good fascine layer. As an alternative, so you actually stops the material, the, the stone going into the peat, so that it is something to think of when you're working on those sort of peat sites. Also, something to look at for heavy clays, so minimize um, that integration, so you can control the amount of material you're actually using. And brash and stumps should only be there for deep peats. If the shallow peats, you should be removing the full peat from mineral soils. Should never be there, and um, because they will decay and weaken it. So again. As you can see in the picture there, it's easy enough for us to go in and find, um, it, see if there is any material there, if you're suspicious of it. It doesn't take long to dig down through a, through the road and see that that's there. So it is important, lop, top, and um, brash should not be on, on under a road on a mineral site, because it will, over duration, over the life of the road, weaken it. Um, and next, Karen. And just finally, just to remember, please read and refer to the documents, the Cove Forest Road Manual and the Technical Standard. As I said at the beginning, cannot overemphasize the need to do that. These are the main standards. They have a lot of detail in there. I've just hit some of the main points up to now. And I suppose there is a lot of information in culvert design. Um, Eugene mentioned that um, it is important when you are designing cul um, culverts or bridges that they are sized correctly using the formula that Eugene showed. And we would like, uh, if there's bridges, the full design calculation should be submitted as well. So it is important when they are being done, that you actually do provide that there. That's a quick run through the main points in relation to the forest road design. I suppose we'll go on to questions next. Thanks for that, Robert. Just bear with me. Great. Um, thanks, Robert. And, th and thanks, Eugene and, and Martina. We have some really good questions here, and I'm going to work down through those. If anybody else has questions, pop pop them on. And we leave a bit of time for discussion if anybody wants to make comments and so on. But I'm going to deal with the questions in the chat. If you want to put your questions in the chat, if you have them, uh, still, we, we, we look at those. Um, the first question I have here is from, from uh, I, I won't get into who's asking the questions. I'll just, I'll just go into the questions themselves. Is the funding available for 130 linear kilometers or equivalent kilometers? The 130 kilometers is in terms of funding, so that would be equivalent. That's going to be the money available rather than the, the actual end, end linear length. Um, as you may be aware, we have equivalent lengths for some types of turns. Robert's described some of those there. There's bellmouth entrances and so on. So the planning and the consent that we give for roads is done in terms of linear meters and grant aid is in terms of equivalent uh, meters, equivalent linear meters, where we have features like bellmouth entrances. You may have depth areas and so on where there's more material required and there's allowances for those. But particularly for the turning areas, bellmouth entrances and so on, there is uh, additional e equivalent areas for those. So that we're, we're dealing with equivalent uh, equivalent kilometers in the in the in the overall scheme. 
Um, next question is, is the opt-in for the design support measure available on the IFRS systems for applications? When you're opting in, you can select that. If you have uh, single consent applications, if you have had engineers involved in design work on those, you can access that design support measure at the opt-in stage. Tick the box, send us back the opt-ins. But you've got to tick the box um, and we've made allowances for that. Um, typically, there's no material changes on the on the category one opt-ins, so uh, it's a it's a it's a grant aid measure only, and we're going to retrofit that to those applications. So hopefully that will help. Um, if the applicant doesn't own sufficient land on either side of the entrance for the required sight lines, this is a kind of a a, a third party permissions issue. Uh, we've had this ongoing. Uh, we generally we generally try and issue the licenses with a condition to resolve, and it's going to be up to the applicant. To resolve the permissions required or to achieve the sight lines that's that's going to be on, on the applicants to resolve those issues after the license is issued and similarly for rights of way again third party rights of way issues third party property issues uh, the onus is with the applicants to resolve those um, and we have a query further down on the third party rights of way please resolve those issues before you make applications uh, the, the a lot of the applications that we have, the older ones that we still have on hand here, uh, and some of the ones that we've sent back and withdrawn are cases where we have third party rights away issues that haven't been resolved by the applicants and where we're not in a position to resolve them. Um, it's best to resolve those issues before you make the application and that may, makes the uh, application run through the system much more smoothly then uh, uh, afterwards. Um, there's questions around communications with engineers. I said it my Sharon, own. Can I add? Can I add to yeah. that? Just, just at that point. Um, I'm just saying, in relation to the sight lines, if you've been in discussion with your ne the neighbours and cannot provide, and they're not willing to allow you to cut back the hedgerows, your option there is if you're you're reduced if you do, if these part the public road is such that it requires full 160 meter sight lines. You then need you have a departure from standard option to work with in the technical standard, at which point it is a matter of discussing the issues with the county council and working out an alternative option there and doing that before you come to the department um, at this with an application. There's no point in coming in with something you know that's not going to be successful that you know you cannot um, provide the site lines. There's no point in looking for consent for that if you know it, you will not be able to provide them once you get to approval. So do talk to the county council, go in, talk to them, explain the situation, and they work with them at coming up with a solution, and then to provide the full details of that solution as part of the consent, and we will be able to work with that at that point. But it is important to talk to the council and use that departure from standard option there in the actual technical standard. That would be the way to do it if you cannot cut back the hedgerows for whatever reason, or if it's maybe a solid mass concrete wall or something that's in the way. Or that that's that's very helpful. Thank thanks for that. Um the next one I have here are will issues with single consent be communicated to engineers? Uh as I said, we have we have a register, uh not a register, we have a directory of engineers. We've had a very low uptake of people interested in that. If you are working, and we, we work with some, uh, we're in regular contact with some of the engineering uh, outfits who are providing input on a lot of the road networks, and a lot of companies are sharing the, the, the same engineers. So we have access and we have had contact with, with some of those, but not with all of those. If you're working with engineers, please make sure that they're on that directory and that they've applied to go on that directory. And then we, it makes it easier for us to know who's who, who's out there, and who do we need to contact, who do we need to communicate with, with updates and different things and, 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 and interactions on training and so on uh, as they come up. So that's, that's very important. And I said that myself, we want to try and create a community of forest road professionals here, uh, whether, whether they're foresters or engineers, whatever their background, um, that we can exchange on these things and, and, and share training and so on. I think that's going to be really important. Um, there's a question here on the use of recycled material uh, and the use of those near water courses. We, we, we'll we clarify that. We'll come back with, with clarity on the use of recycled materials. I think it's going to be a new space for us uh, by and large. 
and there are some 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 different issues relating to these types of materials, particularly around certification. And uh, and we'll come back with with more information on that. Um, I have a question here on speed surveys, and I might hand this to Robert. Are there other ways to prove the design speed of the road? We've had this. This has been a consistent one since we started. Uh, Robert, if you want to come in on that. Yeah, there there are alternative ways. I suppose the preferred option is a speed survey, but if you're on a small um, local road, a, ther a tertiary local road, you're not going to have the vehicle movements. It, we have communicated out there, um, I think in, in, the, in the last couple of years, 18 months or more. Um, it is a case of the engineers to actually drive the road um, comfortable speeds, recording the speeds that they are actually achieving, to record down the, the speed driving up and down number of times, and we're saying minimum of six times, three three times in each direction, um, and record the actual speed that they can do. And it's to drive it in a fair way. Don't just drive it at high speed thinking you can do it. What would be a safe driving speed to get a fair judgment on the actual design speed on the road? When they are the, those local tertiary roads, it can be difficult. You can be sitting there waiting the whole day if you're trying to do a speed survey to get seven or eight cars to know what speeds they'd be doing. But so, yes, there are alternatives there, but it is important to provide full details of how the speed has been assessed um, in the actual application. And it's important, I suppose, you start with that speed, speed assessment of the public road. And I suppose it's to provide details then of the widths, um, the camber on the road, condition of the road, full details and information and the alignment. So, so we'd have that to understand and get a feel that whether the speed survey is reasonable for what is going there and the road condition, if it's full of potholes or if it's a good new surface, um, the, having that information helps to actually make that decision and understand that a, a true design speed has been provided. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Uh, we've got a question here on the uh, availability of special construction works funding for tarmacadam or concrete at entrances. Uh, that's, that's, we don't have, that's not our intention. And uh, if local authorities are requesting, there are specific situations where local authorities might request or where the standard requires uh, concrete or sealing of the entrances uh, uh, to prevent material coming out onto the road, et cetera. Um, and there are specific requirements for that. So that's built built into the into the scheme itself. If we don't we haven't considered really using SCW for that, and that's not my intention at, at the moment. And certainly the if if that those requirements are popping up in situations where those measures are not warranted, um, if you would bring those to our attention, certainly we, we want to make sure that those requirements are only used where they're where they're needed on, on sites with slopes and particular particular entrance uh, uh, situations. Um, they shouldn't be used in a, in every case, and they're certainly not intended to be used in every case. Um, another question is: Would forest stability or utilizing the forest road grant to the best effect be a valid reason for relaxation of standard for a forest entrance? And in terms of forest stability, probably not. But sometimes the location of your road, the the location of the entrance, is uh, on a, on a public road. Is defined by the layout of the forest, or the, that 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 is the best place to put that entrance naturally, and and I think in that then that would become part of the rationale for the relaxation and would need to be described uh, in, in terms of that. Uh, and it, but the real issues around the relaxation are in relation to road safety and in relation to the the technical standard. If you know th there has to be a good reason. For the relaxation and typically the road alignment itself um, and the speed we just discussed that the road uh, the design speeds etc they're the main reasons usually for 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 relaxation I don't know robert do you want else to to bring it yeah, to just to reiterate it is important if you look if you're moving to somewhere for it but you must the design speed must be assessed to the public road so you must achieve the required sight lines and um, eugene went through those um, in detail. So if you have, you, it's not a question of having a, an 80 kilometer an hour road and saying 
for the because the the forest layout requires me to move it to a certain position, I can go with a, a fifty meter sight lines. That is not suitable. The sight lines, design speed, and sight lines must be achieved still. So you, if you are looking for reduced sight lines, the, the design speed must be correct. So you have to assess the design speed primarily, and that has to be right for the reduced sight lines. So you cannot go for reduced sight lines without them. Um, unless the design speed of the road is is reduced also. So it's, it's not sufficient just to be um, the actual, um, for, for the forest or utilizing the, the forest road grant. That is not, not sufficient in its own right, just to, to select a relaxation. You must meet the conditions of the relaxation. It might mean you'll go to somewhere where you have a reduced design speed rather than the full sight lines. That would be understandable on those basis that basis but you must meet the full setup in the in terms of the conditions for that relaxation okay thanks robert uh the next one i have here is is culvert design detail required for all large culverts or only on grant aided roads we, we look within the scheme if you have a crossing point and you're putting a, a culvert or a clear span bridge in you need to justify uh the scale of that and particularly where culverts, where piping is being used, and we need that, that that is part of the, the process there. You should be considering the uh, waterway area and doing those calculations before you specify, or before your engineer specifies uh, a culvert size, particularly with culverts. Uh, so that, that that's part of it. And I have another question here. Uh, can we confirm when IFRS will be updated so that mandatory documents such as an NIS and ornithological reports won't be required as it's unworkable. Look, we're aware of those situation with uh, some of the, the new questions that are there are relating to other schemes. And we're going through a process now, we will be for the next week of testing and testing at different points in it from the forester's point of view as well. And uh, there'll be some fixes applied. So hopefully some of those issues will be resolved um, in, in, the, in, the, in before, before, before next week. Um, will we consider grant aiding tracks uh, at this point, the program is set. We deal with roads. We're dealing with harvesting roads only. Um, we're not going to consider tracks at this point. We've, we've set the, we've set out our stall here. Um, and similarly, if there's an old road formation in situ, does surfacing of this formation require a road permit? Uh, that's a really good question. Going back to the previous question, there are tracks and there are roads. A track is not a road. Um, if you are upgrading a track to forest road standard, you may require a permit for that. If the road has been previously constructed, has a surface, has a capping, was previously uh, previously developed as a as a full road, uh, that will not require a, a permit. That is an existing uh, existing forest road. And what you're doing there, any any maintenance work there, really uh, is it will, will not require a permit. Um. So the next question is for the 15 meter tree uh, clearance requirement. Uh, was it not removed? No, that is in place very clearly and hasn't been removed. So we still have that requirement and we've built in some of the biodiversity measures around that. So that's very clearly that 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 is there. And it's an important part. And Robert has described that around making sure that roads are dry, etc. and kept uh, kept dry. Um, in terms of a really good question here in rela relation to gradients and the capacity of trucks. Um, we're still dealing with the one and ten gradient, um, and I think that's a that's a safety measure. It's a good safety measure, and it's a good requirement. Uh, yes, and technology has moved on. Truck technology and capacity, and engines, and all the rest with the power of trucks has improved in the last few years. But we're still sticking with that uh, for 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 the moment. We've, we've no plans to change that. It's not just the truck issue. You actually have the road. It, potentially as well, the materials not holding under the road as okay. well on the road. So it's not just the trucks getting the grip. They might not actually have something to grip it sufficiently too. So, but it is something we will keep in mind. And that's why we do look for allow for short period, short se sections that will exceed okay. that if if it's absolutely necessary. But it has to be very well set out why we would. There's a uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, the next, there's a question here on worked examples. I think it's good uh, that point was made also in relation to afforestation, and we'll try and develop some worked examples. Uh, we're conscious also of people's time 
in in different training things. So what we might do is record some worked examples, pop those up where people can access those. And we will deal when we get into live training, uh, we will deal with some worked examples in, in, in that. So uh, look, that's a fair point. And I think it's an important point that we would have some worked examples to show people. And I think when it comes to things like that waterway assessment, particularly for the engineers, just getting people into that uh, into that space, I think it will be important to have some worked examples to show people. So we, we'll certainly consider that. Um, in relation to tracks, um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Do you need permission? Probably. If your vehicle is driving in the forest without a, a constructed track, you obviously don't need permission. If you are building tracks, there may be other requirements there that you need to consider. So, yeah, we, we'd, we'd like to come back with more detail on, on that one. Um, again, there's worked examples on equivalent lengths. That is in the Coford manual. And I think we have some worked examples also in the forestry, uh, the, in the forest road scheme document, uh, how, they're, how they're assessed and how the equivalent roads are assessed. Uh, we'll go back and we'll check that they are fit for purpose and um, and have a look have a look at those. If they're not, or you don't feel that the examples there are fit for purpose, please come back and let us know, and we'll address that. Um, the 160 meter sight, sight line. So we said that they're excessive, and and so forth. That's what we have in the technical standard that has been agreed between the Department of Transport and the Department of Agriculture, and we're 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 operating that. We're not in a position to renegotiate that uh, technical standard and we've no intention of renegotiating that at this point. It's really important that we just apply the technical standard and we use the relaxation allowances and we use the departures that we have uh, where, where, where those standard uh, sight lines can't be achieved. So we have, uh, we have a process, uh, processes for those. Um, there is a standard procedure for departures and that's set out in the requirements for forest road entrances, and uh, and it's important then that um, that you apply that process and uh, with the local authorities uh, to do that. And there should be a, there should be a standardised approach there between local authorities to that. It is in that standard. Um, and then look, sure, it, just go back yeah. to that one on the sight lines again. Just uh, just uh, just it should be remembered that. If you're doing an entrance, it doesn't matter whether you're getting ground aid or not, the consent is required. Um, and I suppose it's important is just that one finishes um, the even for small sites, it doesn't matter whether we're, it is a requirement to seek consent, whether you're looking for funding for the works or not, yeah. um, they do, it actually applies. So just because, just um, to consider, oh, yeah, I can put the entrance in and I don't need it, I'm not going for grant aid. So I can put in an entrance. I'm sorry, that's not perm permitted, and yeah. that's going to cause a lot of problems across the whole system if a lot of applicants right. start doing that. Yeah, I think that's um, a good point, Robert. And we have been processing non-grant aid applications, and many of those non-grant non-grant aid applications to date have involved single consent. They're still subject to that, and they've been processed on that basis. So that's that's clearly the case. Yeah. And, um, and, I gotta, I gotta and on those sure. small rural roads, they you will be able to get a relaxation. The the design speeds will be down, so getting you won't need the full 160 once you put in the design speed and have the have, uh, have the details. Yeah, look, there's 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 lots of issues around around that that people just need to need to adjust to, and again the sightline standard is set in the technical standard and that's what we're that's what we're applying um that is set and certainly there's a difference between that the height that's set which relates to probably a, a normal vehicle a car uh and what what's available from a truck in terms of the vi visibility but we have the standard and the standard is what we apply here um the question for robert here in relation to the minimum and maximum uh pavement depths on road formations is the uh, um, sorry lost it here is it is a 50, 50 millimeters minimum and 100 millimeters maximum for 804 depths on road formations I'd say 50 millimeters minimum you can go deeper um, but there is the cost aspect you can go deeper than the 100 millimeters but it's the cost aspect is why most people won't okay and I, and I think the last question here, I think I maybe have two more. Uh, 
given that DAFM are the single consent authority, why are we asking, asking us to engage with the county council with entrance issues? Very simple. The county councils are the roads authorities in most areas. And for certain relaxations, and certainly for departures, uh, you're going to need the input from the local authorities and the, the support of the local authority people on, on it. Uh, what we've seen in a number of areas is that our performance with applications has improved where we've had direct contact uh, and prior contact with local authorities to, to resolve issues or to clarify issues with the local authority prior to, prior to committing to an application here. And I think that is probably best, best practice in it. Uh, and certainly where we've, where we've had issues with local authorities, those issues have been largely addressed or resolved with, um, with uh, consultation, direct consultation with the local authorities. Uh, sorry, uh, and there's a clarification on tracks, forwarding tracks. Forwarding tracks don't need permission uh, and they don't, they don't need permission, but you should maintain uh, the um, uh, compliance with the, with, the, with the water quality guidelines, the environmental considerations that we have. Um, I'm just going to check. I have one hand here from Kieran O'Connell. Kieran, do you want to come in there with a comment? And then we're going to wrap up. Can you hear me all right, Kieran? Go ahead, just about, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I just want to come back there on the sight line issue um, and the road conditions. We found that the county councils will only accept um, a speed survey with the, with the GPS units um, that are methodology behind them they will not seemly accept or they don't seem to accept a visual or a, a drive over to determine the 85 percentile speed yeah i suppose Kieran, it will depend on the road what what the road standards is for most cases if you're on a regional road i would always expect a full gps full proper survey yeah if it's a if it's a, oh, yeah. a tertiary local road I would be expecting them to. We would have to just look at those ones then. Yeah, just uh, just from our experience dealing with the councils, they want to have verifiable data that they can that they can justify a decision on the relaxation. As was for the regional roads and primary local roads, you would need a full GPS survey, full proper survey, because you'll have the vehicle movements. Yeah, if we can, we can in particular. Councils you're dealing with here, maybe we could discuss it offline afterwards and address the, those particular councils. If if I, I think I think it's horses for courses, and I think it comes down to that differential between the types of roads and the level of traffic and the speed of that traffic. And again, if you have a, a single lane road with grass strip up the middle of it, getting two or three vehicle movements a day, uh, getting those sort of technical surveys the speed surveys is is much much more difficult um and we have to have uh, I, and we have had i think we have had access to more descriptive uh basis for 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 some of those rash, the, uh, rationale for that uh based on 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 experience of driving on on those that's acceptable provided they're properly documented and uh and done in a, in a, presented in a reasonable way that people can can have confidence in those I think it's also about being being practical with the particular locations. There just isn't enough traffic to generate traffic surveys. So we just passed one o'clock. Yeah, and there was we might... just one yeah. there, Kieran. Just briefly, just there was a question in relation to the sight lines and the one hundred five meter height and the fact that timber lorries are mostly. No, you can't. It, um, the fact that timber lorries are using it mainly that is not a, an excuse for changing the one hundred five. And cars use it, so the 105 is fixed, and that is not an option for relaxation. Only what's in the technical standard you are, it clearly sets out what relaxations can be applied in the technical standard, and those are the only relaxations. Anything different from that, and you're into a departure. So to go, trying to go to something higher than the 105, that would be a departure from the standard. Okay. Okay. So. Thank you all for your time here this morning and, 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 and for this. And we'll try and follow up with some, I think, some worked examples. That that comment is very, very good. And we'll also try and follow up with some field stuff uh, when, 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 when we get a chance here. We have a lot of work to do over the next couple of weeks. 
So bear with us uh, while we do that. And we'll take feedback at any point if people have particular issues that pop up over the next uh, the next couple of weeks uh, in the remainder of this particular year. Uh, come back and we'll uh, and we'll we'll try and help you with those issues. And um, and again, thanks for your for for for, for joining us today. Um, if you're in, yeah, you won't you won't need to put your name in the chat function here. This is slightly different to some of the other A4 ones. Um, but we will we have a recording of this and it will be up on the web. Anybody who couldn't make it, uh, we will put these up and it will be available for people in in the same location as the afforestation uh, measures. Um, I email. There's one last question here. It's a good point. Email for suggestions. Uh, you can come to myself here directly with suggestions or comments, particular issues on the scheme. Uh, I'm, I manage a scheme here, so you can come to me directly with those, and I'll be happy to have those, and we'll discuss them. So thanks very much for that, and uh, and thanks for your time here today.